Koyalath writes, So I turn to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? And I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that the one fate befalls them both. Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. For there is no lasting remembrance of the wise men or as with the fool. And as much as in the coming days all will be forgotten. And how the wise man and the fool alike die. So I hated life. For the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after the wind. We're actually going to cover all the way down into verses 24 through 26 this morning. We'll come back and look at verses 24 and 26 a little bit more in detail. Uh, but we're going to end on a happy note. <clears throat> So thankful for this text and the movement, the way that the Spirit has led Solomon in writing these things down. And I absolutely do believe that it is Solomon who is writing this. And I'll get to the point of that as we move through this passage together, why that's important. But I wanted to begin with sort of laying some history on y'all. And I'm sure y'all have heard of the New Hebrides. And these were named by Captain James Cook. Called them the Hebrides Islands, the New Hebrides, because it reminded them of the Hebrides Islands off the coast of Scotland. Yay, Scotland. Um, and up until about the 1800s, there wasn't any known to be any kind of Christian influence there. Two missionaries decided to go there by the name of John Williams and James Harris. And upon arriving on this island, they were attacked by cannibals, they were killed, they were cooked, and they were eaten within the sight of the ship that brought them to the island. So this interaction comes between a gentleman, John G. Patton, who was planning on heading to these same islands, and another brother, Mr. Dixon. And Mr. Dixon, he exploded at Patterson. He said, the cannibals... <laughs> You will be eaten by cannibals, obviously still fresh in his mind the reality of what happened to these previous missionaries. As he says this to Patton, Patton's response to him is, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave and there to be eaten by worms. He says, I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. We know that he finally went to the islands and he led many to Christ. And he declared that Aniwa was one for Christ. As a result of the ministry there, he lost his wife and his son in the first bout of time that he spent there. But he had this thought in his head and this was the principle that drove him. And it is this, only one life will soon be passed only what's done for Christ will certainly last. This is really the conclusion that Solomon is going to come to as he walks through this section of Ecclesiastes for us. And, and I'll put the first two chapters in a little bit better of light for you. But he is going to talk about these next two realities, the futility of wisdom, though it excels folly, and the futility of work and wealth. And he is going to view both of these in light of the reality of death, the certainty of its coming. And the futility of things then in light of that. And I have to say that I, I appreciate this, that he is going to cover this. Because I find that death has a way of doing that for us. It has a way of simplifying life for us. It have, has a way of sort of focusing us on the things that we need to focus on. If any of you in here, and there are a few I'm sure who've had this near-death experience, it has a way of awakening you up to the things that are really important in life. And Solomon is coming to grips with this, and so he's going to deal with the issue of his wisdom and the issue of work and wealth in light of this reality of the fact that we all are going to die. 
And we know that he is talking about this because in verse 14 he's going to mention the one fate that befalls both the wise and the fool. He also talks about the fact in verse 15 as he acknowledges for himself and the statement is emphatic, although it doesn't always come across in our English translations, when he says to himself in verse 15, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. And this statement is emphatic in Hebrew. Gamani, I know this is what's going to happen to me. It isn't just merely, so he's not merely just looking at this is for the wise, this is the fool, but also for the one who happens to be one of the wisest people that ever walked this earth, it's also going to happen to me, as wise as I am. So it has a way of sort of putting things in check for us, and it is going to do that for Solomon as he weighs these things. So Koilath is going to turn in verse 12, and he's going to consider things from a different point of view. He's going to talk about wisdom, work, and wealth here in these next two sections. And then he's going to end verses 24 through 26 on a positive note, and we will end there this morning with that. But what good is it then, is he's going to ask the question, what good is it then to be wise and wealthy if you're going to die and leave everything behind? And he carries this thought into verse 18 and following, Thus I hated the fruit of my labor, for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Again, highlighting the fact that he is going to die, pass away, and whatever he has accomplished is going to be left to somebody else. But what if they don't deal with it in wisdom and in knowledge and so on? So he is going to add to his list this first catalog of vanities. We started looking at this in chapter 1, verse 4. We saw the vanity in the natural world, 4 through 11 of chapter 1, the vanity of wisdom and knowledge in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, the vanity of pleasures, possessions, and accomplishments, 2, 1 through 11, and now he's going to deal with more on the vanity of wisdom and then the vanity of work and wealth. In chapter 2, we have Coralay through tested life in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. He hates life, and this is a twofold declaration that we get out of this. Verse 17 is the closing statement of the first few verses of this next section we're looking at. He says, I hated life or I loathed it for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me because everything is futility and striving after the wind. He realized that this is a hateful existence if all I'm doing is striving for the things that are under the sun. He is going to focus on these two elements and then he is going to talk about life accepted verses 24 through 26, and he is going to acknowledge that it is a gift from God. So we begin this morning in verses 12 through 17, the futility of wisdom, and wisdom excels folly, no doubt. He acknowledges that fact, but the same end they face together, and that is the end of death. The same reflection goes on, the investigation is everything under the sun. If you notice with me walking down through the text, verse 17 we have mention of under the sun, verse 18 under the sun, verse 19 under the sun, verse 20 under the sun, verse 22 under the sun. So all of this is under the sun. This is nothing new in his investigation. He's not looking at a different realm. But understand that he has the sense of reality of eternality. He's going to get to that in chapter 3, but he is priming the pump, if you will. He's getting it ready, and he's leading us in a direction he wants to take us, because in chapter 3, he's going to deal with the issue of eternality, and he's going to deal with the issue of the fact that God is sovereign and in control. So he is going to start taking us into the reality of who God is and so on in the chapters that follow. But he states in verse 12, just as he does in verse 11, actually, it's the same statement. So I turned to consider, literally in the Hebrew it is ra'ad, as I looked or beheld to see. He was going to contemplate wisdom, madness, and folly. Now, madness and folly, they go together. So there's really only two things that he highlights here. But he's going to turn his mind to a new consideration. It's the same wording he uses in verse 11 as he mentioned the fact that thus I considered. He uses that again here as he moves to another element in the way he's going to view everything. So in a sense we could render it this way. I turn myself to behold. I turn my thoughts to consider. Solomon is facing the facts. And this is what death does for us. It helps us to face the facts. And Solomon is going to help us to do this as we walk through this together. So verse 12, he's going to add the statement then on, well, what more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? He isn't saying this in the sense of boasting, but it's actually a lament. But he's really asking, 
how can his successor do anything more than he's already done? I mean, in other words, if he takes on the same kind of investigation that Solomon did, will he come to any other conclusion? Could they do better than he did? Could they see something that he didn't see? He's not boasting that he has done this thoroughly. It's a lament. The reality of it is there's nothing new for you to discover here under the sun. In other words, all the effort I put into this, the exhaustion and the investigation and everything that he pursued in this, he came up with no positive answers to the questions that were asked. And we saw the first question asked all the way back in chapter 1, verse 3. And he says, and anyone who can come after me can follow me in this investigation and they won't do any better. And this is a, a lamentable moment. There's no other conclusion that you can come to in all of this. Now we have to understand that Solomon, he comes to this conclusion, but we can't necessarily expect that every, everyone else is going to come to the same conclusion. At least when we're dealing with unbelievers. Because we know that Solomon has had the lights turned on for him. He's tasted of the graciousness of God. He's tasted of God's forgiveness. He's delighted in the presence of God and had fellowship with Him. He's partaken of all of these elements. So it isn't an unbeliever looking at these things. This is a believer, and we have to keep this in mind. But the advantages that come in wisdom, verses 13 through 14, he says, I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. So there's some benefit to this. So I had to ask myself, well, if there's benefit to wisdom, then, then how do I understand what he's trying to get at here? And really, the answer comes with this statement, under the sun. Everything is under the sun. In other words, everything is about the earthbound. Everything is about merely in this life. So this is how he wants us to understand the wisdom as he talks about it, because he can acknowledge, no doubt, there is some relative value to wisdom over folly. It's as different as night and day. This is a good thing. There are things that we can benefit from wisdom. Proverbs, we should pursue wisdom. It's just like a torch walking in the darkness. It helps us to see things easier and to walk safely. It keeps us from tripping over things and it helps us as we walk through life. It can give us skill in life to answer all the complexities that come around the corner as we face things in life. There is benefit to this. But then as you start to think about wisdom, it takes a person a long time to learn how to live and before you know it, life's over with. All that striving for what? And this is what Solomon wants us to come to the conclusion to because he's going to lead this into this conclusion as he walks through this. Yes, there's benefit to wisdom over folly as his light is to darkness, but at the same time, their end is exactly the same. So then what does it benefit me to put all my time and effort into gaining all of this wisdom and focusing on all of this wisdom if it's only for life under the sun? And it takes me no further than that. In other words, it's very pragmatic. It's very beneficial. It's useful. However, as he says in verses 14 through 16, the futility of wisdom is seen in the fact that the foolish and the wise, they both have the same fate. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. I mean, you think about it, right? All the striving to gain possessions and property and all of these things that he did later on, earlier on in chapter 2 in the parks and, and all of these trees that he planted and everything else to, to bring gratification to his life, all of this stuff that he did, right? Even the accumulation of knowledge and wisdom, it was all done for under the sun. And therefore, this is the only place that it benefits but all of that accumulation, now that when I die, I don't take it with me. And I leave it to someone behind me, but who knows what they're going to do with this. We can leave a legacy for our children even of godliness, but we don't even know what they're going to do with that, do we? So the certainty of death, no doubt, is he going to return to this thought as we walk through Ecclesiastes. This is something that he's going to bring before our face over and over and over again. Wisdom cannot solve the ultimate question of life's purpose then. He says there's advantages, but with its advantages, wisdom cannot overcome the ultimate equalizer of both the sage and the fool, and that is death. In other words, there's no resurrection. There is no truth of the reality of eternality. So there's a benefit to this, but it can only take us so far. 
So pursuing wisdom and education, it produces limited advantages, limited to only to this life. There's nothing that goes beyond this life with these things. Wisdom can't prevent death, nor does it supersede death. It doesn't give us the answer on how to conquer this death. And Solomon says, and we all face this death. We all will die. So then he asks himself this question in verse 15. And you got to imagine how painful it is for him to ask himself this. So he says to himself as he speaks in his heart and he's carrying on this conversation with self. He says, self, why then have I been extremely wise? What's the point? I mean, the queen of Sheba came all the way, right, to his kingdom because she heard about his wisdom. And he sits and reflects on this and he says, but what's the point? If I face the same death as the fool, he's off frolicking around, he's just aimless, he's doing whatever he feels like, he does this one minute, then that minute, and this and then that, and he doesn't care anything about life, and he's la-di-da, and partied up, and do whatever you want to do, and here I am, I'm striving to understand, to learn, to grow, to walk skillfully in life, and yet in the end we both die. So why not just throw your hands up? Join the party. The thing for Solomon is that as he asks this question implies more than just futility. The question implies that there is something better in which Solomon could have occupied himself with in his life. In other words, he is coming to the realization and he is there. The Spirit is leading him as he walks through this. He's come to that point and he's taking us on this journey with himself as he goes back to these past things. But he's helping us to understand that it is better for a person to prepare for eternity than to immerse oneself in preparing for this life alone. He's going to bring us to eternity in chapter 3, but understand, He is taking us through this process. But remember, this is a man who's been enlightened by the divine working of God. This isn't an unbeliever saying these things. He's going to highlight two things for us in verses 15 and 16. Pursuing wisdom is futile because it cannot change man's destiny. And 16, pursuing wisdom is futile because it cannot build a redeeming legacy after death. All is forgotten. When you go, who's going to remember? The frustrating conclusion then comes in verse 17. So I hated life. It's a brutal ending, right? So I hated life. What's the point? I mean, this is what we want to do when we come alongside our unbelieving neighbors is we want to take them on this journey. We want to help them see from this journey that Solomon took, right? Help them see the futility of striving after everything under the sun. Because in the end, it brings you nothing. And it doesn't answer those ultimate questions. And it doesn't answer the ultimate question of where will you be in eternity? So Solomon says, I loathe life because what happens on earth seems awful to me, for all the benefits of wisdom are futile like chasing after the wind. He talks about the fact that there is such an injustice in all of this. As the NASB translates it, he says this is evil. There's such injustice in this. I give you this quote by Hank Stenberg, and I think it's very interesting. He had this observation He says, this statement of hating life is by no means in itself true repentance, but such feelings are for the well-disposed a powerful motive to return to God. This is what we see happening as Solomon takes us on this journey. This is what happened in his life. In other words, we shouldn't expect that someone is going to imitate Solomon's investigation and come to the same dramatic conclusion that he did without some divine enablement. Solomon comes to this because he's a believer, not an unbeliever. 
And we've mentioned this before, but there are so many statements about him in the Old Testament that would reflect the fact that he is a believer. This is the later end of his life. This is him coming back around to a right relationship with the Lord. And this is he is recording us that journey that he took and how he went through that. But just a basic sort of general you know, defense for the fact that Solomon is a believer. If he's not a believer, he's the only unbeliever who ever wrote sacred scripture. Has that ever happened before? No. No. So all of this is from someone who has tasted of these things, right? As Barak, one of my Hebrew professors, said, the unbeliever holds no means of evaluating the difference between their lost condition and the experience of divine forgiveness and blessing because they haven't experienced this yet. But Solomon is talking out of this experience. He's tasted the glorious wonders of God's divine grace. God has granted him this divine wisdom. He can perceive these things. And all the way through all of this stuff, he reminds us that he kept his wits about him. He kept his objectivity. And he walked with wisdom through this as he analyzed and investigated this life. So once having basked in the warm glow of divine presence as he prayed in the dedication of the temple and so on, Solomon knows that there is something more to this life than just life under the sun. And he is fully aware at this point that he has lost its joy. And he understands just like his father David that the joy of the Lord's salvation needs restoration in his life. He is coming around to this reality as he records this journey for us. David writes in Psalm 51, Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And this is where Solomon is coming. Barak goes on to say more than that. However, it was his way to fulfill what his own father had declared would be the result of his restoration. When David writes in Psalm 51, 13, after being restored to God and the joy of his salvation, he says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. This is what Solomon is doing with Ecclesiastes. It is apologetic. It is evangelistic. Solomon moves us then to verses 18 through 23, and we're going to walk through this quickly. Most of this is pretty self-explanatory, but we'll come back to some thoughts from these verses next week. But he's going to address the issue of the futility of work. A life of accomplishment only accumulates a legacy of futility. He's going to deal with work and wealth, the outcome of the work. There's an old Jewish proverb that I was reminded of, there are no pockets in shrouds. Can't take it with you. Or if I can put it in, in pedestrian terminology, there are no, no U-Hauls behind hearses. And this is the, the, the frustration that he has, right? Because here I accumulate all these things. I leave it to the guy who comes after me, but what's he going to do with it? Who knows? Will he use knowledge and wisdom as he handles it, or is he going to just squander all of that? So several points he lays out for us in these verses. First, in verse 18, you can't take it with you. And there is this emotional hatred that he has for this. Thus I hated the full fruit of my labor, for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows what he'll do with it. I thought it interesting, you're thinking about the issue of the things that he's accumulated for himself. One of the things was great riches and wealth. In the earlier verses of chapter 2 we saw, and I remind myself of this reality, that, that money is a medium of exchange. And it's interesting how so many people pursue to have it, but really it doesn't do any good unless you spend it. Amassing it doesn't do anything. You can't eat it. You can't be warmed with it unless you burn it. But that's not going to last long. So unless you spend it, it has no benefit for you. And coming to the lasting realities of life, it offers no benefit for eternality. And I came across this statement by someone from the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Journal of all places. And they said this in regards to money. He says, money is an article which may be used as a universal passport to everywhere except heaven. And as a universal provider of everything except happiness. We can see those who have amassed great wealth for themselves and they're still unhappy. Their lives are still a mess. 
They buy these fancy cars, million dollar rides, and they ride around in these cars to show off everyone their wealth because money isn't any good unless you spend it. And people aren't going to know that you're wealthy unless you go buy expensive things and drive them around and show them these things. But in the end, it doesn't change your eternal existence. And in the end, it brings you no true happiness. This is the reminder that Christ gives us in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, in his parable of the rich fool. He says, For not even when he has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Life is not in what you own. But sometimes we as believers, we find ourselves living this way, don't we? We know that there's a reality beyond the sun, but sometimes when we look at our life, if we look really hard, we realize that we're living life like it's just under the sun and that's it. Money isn't bad. <laughs> Pays the bills, right? But everything has its proper place, and this is what Solomon is going to help us to understand. He goes on in verse 19. You must surrender control to someone else. Emotional despair. I've got to give this to some other guy. Verse 20. You don't get any return on your investment. Can't take it with you. There is deep emotional pain for Solomon here as he looks in these things. There is suffering. There's pressure, the anxiety. I mean, look at our neighbors, the stress they go through to accumulate all of this stuff that they can't take with them. The pharaohs tried. We know it doesn't work. It all stayed here. They went somewhere else, and we know where they went. So all of this anxiety that we have over things, right? And Jesus says, be anxious for nothing. Your father knows that you need these things. Seek His kingdom and His righteousness and what? And these things will be added unto you. You take care of God's business, God will take care of you. That's a promise. So the test then, if we walk through this with Solomon, is that earthly possessions or heavenly treasures, right? Where do we store up our treasures? Verse 21, your hard-earned legacy can end up in the hands of the undeserving. It's a reality. You accumulate all this stuff and someone else who doesn't deserve it is going to get it. We're going to find in later verses 24 through 26, he's going to talk about the fact that here you're going to have the evil striving to accumulate all these things and God's going to use that to provide for His people. Isn't that amazing? That God provides for His people through the unbelievers. The conclusion then in verses 23 through 23, the conclusion is the pursuit of work brings no worthwhile return. Then comes verses 24 through 26. Sorry, I mistyped up there. 24 through 26, the flash of insight. Enjoy what God has given to you, not what you seek after to try to satisfy yourself, but understand these things are a gift from God. He ends in verse 24 and he says, There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. Now, we're going to come back and look at these verses, and we have to because the translation of verse 24 is really unfortunate. And I'll explain that to you next week. But is it not interesting that he just states the basics? To eat, to drink. Not drinking the great stuff. Not eating the gourmet foods. Just eat and drink. He's going to acknowledge these things are a gift from God. And I, I couldn't help but think in regards to my own life, and I end with this thought. Is, so years ago, I don't share much about my past or things I'm ashamed of, and I, I only do it if there's a benefit, I think. But when I read statements like this from Solomon, I, I'm reminded of, a period of my life. I lived on the streets for a time and it was self-inflicted. And so I met a group of people one night and that's a whole other story, but I met a group of people this night and we were all hanging out and everyone was heading back home. It was getting late. So this guy, Johnny, who was a Hispanic young man, he was part of a, a street gang back in those days, CV Trace. And so he asked me, he said, Steve, well, you know, are you going home? I said, no, I, I'm living on the streets. And so I was telling him where I sleep. I had found this place. There's these office buildings that were in a strip mall. And in the backside of the buildings, they, they backed up onto a street. 
and there were these stairways that went up to a couple of the offices at the back end of them. And if you walk up the stairs, there's this sort of these little jut outs that you can sort of go, and I, and I imagine it was probably where the bosses went and smoked their cigarettes at break time, and they would stand out there. Well, the nice thing was that they had these really tall bushes that grew up and sort of to buffer the sound between the office and the street. Well, I found a place up in one of these little areas. I found that I could sleep up there, and that way when cops car, cop cars go by, they can't see me, and if someone's walking down the sidewalk, they can't see me, but I, if I curled up, I could just put my arm on my, use it as a pillow and go to sleep, and so I'm telling Johnny this, and he said, man, you know, just come to my house and, and stay with me tonight. It's kind of cold out. So I, I went to Johnny's house. He lived in, in uh, Santa Fe Springs. And he lived with his mom, dad, two siblings, and his grandfather's grandmother passed away. And so he brought me a, a pillow and a blanket, and he said, you can sleep on the couch. And he's like, I'm sorry I didn't have anything better for you. And I'm thinking, this is awesome, man. I, I can't tell you last time I slept on something soft. This is cool, and I have a blanket. So I woke up the next morning, his mom comes out, and she brings me breakfast, and she brought me a cup of this. It was white rice with milk, warmed up with brown sugar stirred in it. And she gave it to me for breakfast. And my response was not, uh, you know, do you have almond milk? Or maybe some, <laughs> you know, s some stevia or something like that? So I can, I, no, I, I took it, and I, and I hardly ate it, because I hadn't eaten in about a week. Within that week, I think I had a cup of coffee and some water, and that was it. So I was thankful to have that. In those moments, God showed me many things. One of them was that even though I am trying to ruin my life, he still cares about me. And he still graciously provided for me in moments like that. But I reflect on those times because I've been without roof over my head sleeping in alleyways, wrapped up in hefty bags to stay warm. I know what not having life is like. But now I have a roof over my head, and there's food on the table, and there's clothes on my back, and all of these things. But I'm always reminding myself, just be thankful you have something to eat and drink. And Solomon's going to say, just be content with that. Enough of this striving to get, to get, to get. There's always something more that we need. And we live in a world of consumerism, right? So they're always trying to tell us, you need more, you need more, you need more. Solomon ends with this great note. Just be thankful that you eat, that you drink, and these are a gift from God. Be thankful you have a job. It may be a cruddy job, but be thankful that you have a job. At least you have one, because there's a lot of people out now who don't have jobs. Some who don't want them, but there are some who really want jobs and don't have them. So just be thankful, because our God is good, is he not? Mm -hmm. Yes. That would you close.